Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and with me today is a man whose shoes are made of licorice. They're pretty delicious, too. I am the Adam Glass. Also joining us today, once again, a uh, friend of the show, uh, Stephen Goldmeyer. I don't know uh, why I paused there. Yay. I don't, I, it's, 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 my brain was... It was dramatic. Was it was I liked dramatic. it. Yes. I hope Stephen I hope Adam once again. Welcome, some more once clapping. Again. Maybe audience yeah, applause. Some applause. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll I'll take that clapping and just I'll multiply it, it just slightly and multiply it. And so I certainly don't deserve a bunch of clapping. Yeah. But I definitely don't deserve the effort it would take to make it sound <laughs> like I deserve a bunch of clapping. So all right, don't. fine. <laughs> Well, uh, this week's episode is um, about Federico Fellini's 1957 Knights of Cabaria. Yay, uh, co-written, Fellini! Co-written by our, our oh. good old friend, uh, Pierre Paolo Pasolini, uh, who, uh, who you may remember, Pat, as the writer and director of the movie that must not be named. Is he really? Yes. No yes, way! No wonder yeah, I uh, hated this movie so much. <laughs> Fellini, I, I Fellini won... Fellini wanted. Uh, there's like a there's man four writers listed. There's four writers listed. Fellini's one of them. Pasolini's one of them. Uh, but Fellini wanted the uh, the scenes uh, where the prostitutes interact on the streets uh, to have a sense of realism about them. So he invited someone to write who was familiar Frequence, with the criminal underworld. Oh, yeah, who frequents of, uh, Italy. prostitutes? Yes, who frequents prostitutes? Apparently, uh, so he asked Pasolini to do it, and he agreed. So, that, I I don't know how much Pasolini stop? influence there is there. Yeah, no, I mean the podcast. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> What's wrong? No, I just don't want to be involved in anything that involves that man. <laughs> oh, we've already Pat. recorded the one episode. <laughs> okay. It's okay. We it's talked okay. about I'm the sorry. most upsetting thing that's ever happened in my life. I'm so, I'm sorry to surprise you with this information. No, this is the worst thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. That's oh. unbelievable. I just assumed yeah. that he made that movie and then somebody shot him. <laughs> well, or maybe uh, any of the women unfor- in the film murdered him. Unfortunately, Pat, uh, he did make that movie and then someone shot him. But uh, is that really what happened to him? Yeah, that's really what happened. I don't. Oh, it Jesus. wasn't. It wasn't related. But thanks for making a terrible joke about the tragedy of his life. <laughs> well, it, it's worse that I did. It. It's it's better because I did not even know that that happened. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure the timing wise, but it was very shortly after because I'm pretty sure that's his last movie. Um, this one or that one? Salo. Okay. This was this was made years before Salo. Salo was huh. made in '76, uh, I think. Yeah, I couldn't um, remember. Yeah, no, that's a. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And well, now still, you do. You know what? I still don't feel bad. <laughs> Man, uh, I feel like I've I've missed out. No, uh, on you've not missed anything. No, <laughs> no matter what you feel, do not succumb. Because of your uh, your your. I know you, Stephen. I know. Yeah. I know that you like to have this sort of uh, the experience. Of, of of classics to a certain degree of, of things that a lot of people are into you just want to see why they're into them yeah. um, never let that tempt you into watching Sal. no no do not watch this film like, this I thought that was going to go the opposite way no, do not under any circumstances even consider turning this film on you will regret it the moment the moment you do it you'll be like oh my god what have I done I'm just, you know, there, there are very few movies I've ever watched and regretted watching. No, you'll regret this uh, one. You know. I do. I, I, I actually you. do regret watching this yeah, movie. Yeah, so do I. The only one I can think of is uh, Death Becomes Her. Uh, <laughs> with, uh, what is it, Bruce Willis? Yes, anyway. Bruce Willis. <laughs> Uh, that was a fair. that was a bad that was a bad movie on a lot of levels. But no. This is a bad movie on so many different like, levels and so um, much. Yeah, deeper. so I didn't mean to draw an equivalence between yeah. no, it's, Sallow and it's Death it's Becomes like Her. Comparing, <laughs> I don't know, a campfire to the pits of hell or something. It's yeah. the, apples to uh, a, 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 a facing demon. Yeah. 
apples yeah, to exactly. a face eating demon. <laughs> yeah, it's about right. It's a good, it's a good anyway. comparison. No, um, well, so it's so it's so weird to think that the guy who was involved in that disgusting pile of nothing, yeah. uh, of gross whatever, is responsible for what is, to a certain extent, mostly a very lighthearted romantic comedy. Yeah, like for you a know, lot of its run. <laughs> here's something. This is it's what true. I was talking about before we started recording. Okay. Okay. Is it weird that I didn't know it was a, that they were prostitutes for a pretty long time? <laughs> it's a little weird. That is a little weird. Pat. I, I suppose it's not explicit, uh, and and one of the reasons one of the reasons that it hits so close is because I read the back of the DVD case before we started. See, I but, didn't uh, no, like for me. Like I didn't read anything. Okay, I just started the. Okay. In fact, all I read was the Amazon synopsis, which discusses like an innocent hearted girl. They don't use the word. They do not use the word prostitute, <laughs> unless I very unless maybe I have like some sort of really weird aphasia, and they do, and I misread it. Like you, whenever you see the word prostitute, <laughs> yeah, you I just read I this read girl. like lighthearted woman or something like that. No, okay, okay, here we go. Okay, this is Fellini's classic about an optimistic, romantic, poor young woman who lives off of unscrupulous men. To me, I read that and went into the first mm, thirty minutes, maybe longer, of the film. Thinking that she was just one of those, like was it was just a case of like she dates men, goes out with men, and then they buy her gifts. Yeah, you see what yeah. I'm saying? I mean, that's that's certainly something. That's yeah, a that's thing. certainly something that's that not... you could gather from the first. Yeah, right, minutes exactly. So I was like, <laughs> for sure. And I thought maybe the weird lady who was yelling was a prostitute, but I was like, well, maybe she's the only one, and maybe she's like. It's like that classic. Wanda? Thing. Well, I mean, it's that situation. No, not Wanda. The the old woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the, well, the one who we kept describing as a transvestite. Yeah, who right, looked, right. Who well, looked well, a little you know, bit like she might I mean, be. Like, yeah. If you if you put women who are going out with men so that they'll buy them stuff into the same scene with an actual prostitute, sparks would fly anyway, and so that seemed reasonable as well. Um, so yeah, it took me a long time before I realized they were prostitutes. So you you thought they just. Hu- Hung out across the street from the oldest prostitute in the world for for no reason. Have you ever been to Mansfield? <laughs> You're right; it happens. <laughs> like I mean, all it takes is like, oh, this is the place we hang out. <laughs> this is the park, yeah. or whatever, where all the young people in this shit town hang out. Okay, okay. No, I can see. Well, where there you is are. there is a certain amount of like all all of the young people in this town are. Uh, involved with Kabiria's group. Yeah, like, <laughs> it, it, just seeing this movie on its surface, it seems like all the young people in this town are either prostitutes or frequenting prostitutes. Yeah, right, know? exactly. Well, yeah, like, that's why I didn't read them as prostitutes, so, well, that doesn't yeah. exist. That's not a thing. No, that lends, right. that lends to, to your problem with the movie. The fact that there's, there's all those young men hanging out with that group, but they don't seem to actually be involved... Uh, either as customers or, right, or the, on right. the other end it's, it's as prostitutes, really they're just there, weird. dancing. Yeah, I thought, I thought we I were looking there's, at there's... like scene at the diners from like at, at a diner kind of type deal, you know, where all the young kids park their car and hang out and bullshit. Yeah, there's a chance that's closer to the reality of this film. You yeah. know, like like coming in from like, oh, they're prostitutes might be doing the film a disservice. It might be more accurate to think of it as there's this group of young people in Rome and the women in the group sometimes do prostitution to make money, but they mostly just live off of whatever work these men are doing. And that's, they, you know, I mean, that's they how just I read hang it. out. And so, like, when, when that's totally like, fine. Yeah. I don't see that as dis- detracting and from honestly, the film at all. Honestly, I did I not see them as prostitute prostitutes until, um, well, really, not until I think Adam mentioned the word prostitute about two and a half hours ago. <laughs> Yeah. Like, oh. Well, there is there is the scene where she like moves to work in a different part, right? Of and I kind of and she like, says like mm. usually I work whatever street. Yeah, yeah, and at yeah. that point, you kind of have to be like, oh, yeah. Well, I uh, also kind of zoned out during some of the dialogue. So <laughs> yeah, but there, there is also there is also that that you know I'm I'm sure it's because of censors at the time, but she's never really explicitly prostituting, right? You know, she uh, she she hangs out with well, that actor, yeah, okay, and, and it's never it's never discussed that that's a that's a thing. Um, and she right. even well, right, refuses. It, it almost looks like she refuses when he tries to give her money at the end of the night. Yeah, exactly. That almost looks like just a random like he's having a problem with his starlet girlfriend, and he sees sort of the plain, uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, po- poverty stricken young girl, and like he wants to 
try something different. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, just like I said about the last film, and like I find myself saying in a lot of these films, there might be sociological problems with the way this film <laughs> portrays poverty yes. as something glamorous and something pure and something beautiful. Um, so that just throwing that in there, you know, throwing that into the discussion. Yeah, I guess oh, I right. guess at one point I did process it as prostitution when she when the cop is scoping her out. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. that I was like, oh, she's scene. trying to prostitute herself. But I didn't necessarily yeah. read it as this is a we're watching a movie about prostitutes. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, it's. I think it's. I. I. I wish I had seen the film on those terms because it sounds like it's a different you know, film if you than I think you film, guys watch yeah <laughs> oh yeah I think if you approach the film as like a, a young woman who doesn't really know how to make it in the city and later in the film you realize she's resorting to being a prostitute to make money you know that that sort of repaints the film yeah uh, but but you know I I I, uh, I loved the way it existed as it was I thought this was actually a, a really charming really nice movie with a really non-charming, really non-nice ending. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, the char- <laughs> the charmingness is certainly helped by our main actress. Yes, uh, and she is she is a delight to watch. Uh, critics, I, I I'm talking to Stephen because we watched it together uh, during the movie. Uh, I I explicitly said she very much reminded me of Lucille Ball. Uh, yeah, and then we I felt found the out same that, way. Yeah, we found yeah. out that critics at the time actually had started to call her. Uh, the female Charlie Chaplin, um, which which is something that Lucille Ball got too. <laughs> yeah, and which you know again cast the film in this whole different light. Like she's yeah. this um, jovial kind of uh, hilarious physical comedian yeah. uh, in this movie, and yeah. that you know I, I thought it was delightful, yeah. mostly well, because of her. And yeah. I think this specific scene where we had that Lucille Ball flash. I'm sure you remember Pat the scene where she's going to the club and she like gets lost in the curtain. Yeah, yeah. She's going to a fancy club and they're supposed to open the curtain for her and she's like scrambling, like pushing the curtain around, doesn't know what she's doing. And then when she finally comes out, she has that like self satisfied yes, hello kind of look on her face. Yeah. It was very Lucille Ball that scene. Yeah, yeah no, and that's uh, what, again, like that's what like when Adam said like prostitutes it like none of it jives in my head you know what i mean like it didn't work i was like oh really that funny (laughs) like kind of weird little quirky woman is a prostitute yeah 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 uh fellini fellini himself compares her to uh uh the tramp you know uh chaplin's most famous character. character yeah um was used a lot just you know always always indelibly hopeful um no matter what happens uh though i don't think the tramp was ever ever a prostitute well, he not. I, there might be some subtext there that i was missing so i would really change those films <laughs> we need to go rewatch those i'm sure we, i i think we get to watch quite a few of them actually yeah I, i'm pretty sure um, too yeah. No, in all honesty, though, at the same time, I like the story is enjoyable. I don't know; it still reeks of Fellini. <laughs> this was the first Fellini film I've ever seen. So, what does that what does that mean to you? I think it's. I think honestly, like because we watched Armacord, it has soured me, and seeing his name attached to it made me like Armacord is. A really, really crazy film. Not bad per yeah. se, mm-hmm. but just insane. Bonkers. Yeah, it is yeah. bonkers. <laughs> and and it's so, very like, crazy. watching this with like the knowledge that we were, I was watching a movie by uh, like the man who made that. Yeah, it really like made me like watch it in a different way. I think probably like in the same way that your guys' belief that they are all prostitutes made you guys view it in a very specific way. My Knowledge yeah. that Fellini was involved made me immediately go, Ugh, this is going to be weird. And it is a little bit weird. It's not bad. It's interesting, but it's... Yeah, yeah there's a few moments weird. of sort of off-kilter. Yeah, like the, yeah. something yeah. about the way it flows makes me feel weird. Yeah. Um, Omricord is is not only... It's very episodic, which we get kind of here. You know, there's no... right. Um, but it's also, uh, it's surrealness is absurd. It's, it's, it's very surreal, but it's very, it's, 
it's just crazy, you know, what's what's going on in a lot of Armor Court. Um, mm-hmm. It's not necessarily, it's, it's only reflexive of reality if reality's turned up to 11. <laughs> sure. Um, this movie, uh, I've, I, I read a description of this movie suggesting that is kind of, kind of a turning point. One of the first movies to really use, where, where Fellini really started toward that end. Uh, because prior to this, he had worked under, uh, starting in like 46, post-war, um, neo-realism and very, you know, almost grittiness coming out of, you know, post-war Europe, Mm movie-wise. Um, and this, this is where it started to get a little But that's the weird thing about (laughs) this one and with Armour Corps more, much more in Armour Corps, is the absurdity is still gritty. Armour Corps has this weird griminess to it, this weird grittiness to it. And this one has it too. It's, there's elements that are the absurd, but they're still really, yeah, kind of grimy well, yeah. feeling. Well, well, to that regard, I think in my mind, the indicative scene for that feeling in Amacord is uh, when the when the fascists come to the city. Right. Yes. Of course. Um, we obviously know the fascists are the bad guys, um, uh, and they're they're not they're not doing great things, but they just run through the town greeting <laughs> everyone, and everyone's really excited. But they literally run through the town yes. like they're having a parade, but the parade is in triple time. <laughs> yes, uh, and yeah. they go to everything and and yeah, greet everyone. You know, it's it's this sort of you know the undercurrent that that there's there's something dirty going on is there, but it's still very bright. Right. Yeah. Well, the the thing that I thought was the most interesting and weird about this movie, Knights of Kiberia, uh, was uh, that what, the first moment where I was like, wow, there's something really interesting happening here was when that weird uh, processional comes by uh, uh, when she's hanging out with her friends and she's about yes. to, like, hitch a ride with somebody or whatever to get to, to another part of town. And uh, and this processional comes by and she's just drawn to it. And it's yeah. so weird well, and, that's, and droning. Yeah. That felt very I loved that. the same way to me. That sort of, like, that yeah. weird kind of armor cord, Fellini... Well, I, How weird so having not seen any Fellini, you you would say that's like the the most like Fellini ish thing that happened in this film. Well, I mean, is that I, th- I, I think, don't. I think that's a that's a pretty Fellini moment. But I think I think at the same time, you know, this the surrealness in this and and that happens there is is more subdued certainly. Oh yeah, Armacord. sure. Like mm-hmm. I said, Armor Court is is way over the top in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, that is that is a moment. But that moment, uh, that, I don't want to say Armor Court didn't work for me. Um, or, or those surreal moments don't work for me, but this, that scene in particular where she's where she's drawn to that works works on her characterization for me, because mm-hmm. I think it it's it she's she's desperate for hope in anything, you know. I, even in the ending, it's 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 love that keeps her going and a desire for love that keeps her going um, and leads yeah. her down a lot of wrong paths, even in this movie, um, and we don't get a real resolution to her story. Uh, we're still worried about her, I think, uh, at yeah. the end. But uh, but that you know, it's it's all the different things she tries, uh, you know, and that's that's the first hints of her trying religion. Yeah, uh, to the, get out. and then they end up they end up at that at that church. Uh, yeah, in the later scene, it's um, certainly not as weird by any measure yeah. of the word. It just it does feel like that for me, and I didn't. It's not like a bad thing per se. It's just it, yeah. it makes it it makes the film taste different a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I I think I think the first the first real Fellini moment for me is is the first scene where it's all happy and they're in love and they're kissing and then very suddenly he pushes her in the river and steals her. Purse. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for sure. And then and then the yeah. the scene with her after she gets revived, running around like a crazy woman trying to get back yeah, felt like, that way to me too yeah like that, that and, and her yeah her unending yeah. belief that it was an accident yeah right and then yeah. like having to be Proof. have it explained to her that it was not an accident yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, her her like manic denial of what has happened to her 
is uh, the same manic denial that plunges her through that relationship that that with the the man later on, yes. the man that she ends up, you know, she's going to marry and they're going to move in together, and she's just like, oh, you know, I've had such a rough life, but you're perfect, you're an angel, blah blah blah, and that sort of denial, that manic denial, and the hope hopefulness that she's got, you know, is is what leads to that guy yeah. again eventually almost pushing her off of a cliff to her death yeah. to steal her money so yeah for sure that's uh that that manic denial is a big big part of at least her character and her the this, this story of, of her mental development through this film yeah no and i and i actually yeah. like her character that element of her character that um that kind of almost insanity <laughs> of like yeah. refusal to like see reality is is fascinating Right, it yeah. makes her like that really starry eyed watch optimism as she goes through. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I think I, I mean that like like we were saying earlier. I think this film is mostly, except for you know the very dark ending where she's almost <laughs> killed uh, and all that stuff, and a couple dark moments throughout. This film is mostly so light and bubbly and yeah. uh, delightful. You know, she, her her optimism in the face of this sort of like gross situation that she's in in this gross world that she inhabits her optimism is is buoyant and really fun to watch uh and you know like uh, by the time we get to like she's 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 uh she's been picked up by the movie star uh and she's like going with the movie star and it, it's clear the movie star doesn't really have like like gross sexual designs on her he just wants to spend time with somebody yeah she finally lets loose and she starts eating all that food and like jawing about her past and her life and just being just so bubbly and light and i was like yeah you know what all of a sudden i love this character you know i really kind of fell in love with that character by that scene yeah so I, agree. I was a big fan of her characterization in this film. I was a big fan too. I, I yeah, and and it was. I think it's it's indicative of my continual hope that she uh, she will make right in some way and and, right. and and get what she deserves. When we were watching that scene, and I said, I said, I know, I know in my heart that this isn't a precursor to Pretty Woman. Right. <laughs> I know that's not going to happen, but I still want it to happen. Yeah, exactly. We spend the whole movie kind of <clears throat> wanting it to happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then, you know, honestly, Adam, it kind of does. It yeah. is kind of a precursor to Pretty Woman, yeah. right? Because a yeah. rich man says, you don't have to hook anymore. You're my gal, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's the, the, yeah, it's unfortunately. the ending of that story that's tragic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's one problem I had with it is just from a storytelling standpoint, they kind of uh, laid on thick how happy she is when she's with the the angel near yeah. the end. Like she's like, oh, I'm so happy. You no, know, no, who would have so known perfect. the world could yeah. be so perfect? Yeah, and as soon as she starts saying all that stuff at that diner, and he's looking a little shifty eyed, I was like, nope, nope, he's gonna kill her. I don't know how, I don't know when, and I don't <laughs> well, know why, and, but no. he's gonna <laughs> yeah, kill her. But and I'm just <laughs> glad that he doesn't. Exactly. You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. right. As much yeah. as it's yeah. horrible what happens, at least, you know. Right. She can still rebuild her right. life. Right. Like, I mean, that. I kind of thank God that she doesn't, like, die yeah. at the end. Because, like, I, agree I with you. really feel like he might. Like, especially now that I know that the guy who wrote. Helped, uh, the guy who wrote Salo <laughs> is Salo. involved in this. Thank God she makes it out of this movie alive. Yeah. And right. with all of her body think, parts still attached to her. Yeah. I think pr- my principal problem with the movie is uh, just his his motivation. The lack of the lack of understanding there. You know, it, it, I guess it's about the money, but how does he know I that know. He's, she's even got enough money to want to steal? Well, but... So from a storytelling like, standpoint, I have a problem. He spent so much money on her, right, too. Right, right. Yeah. Buying her clothes and food and stuff. I yeah. don't know how much, how worth it it can be. Yeah, I don't know. she doesn't reveal I mean, at I, all that she has that much money in her, in any part of it. There's, well, every, she keeps saying she owns her own house, which yeah. you know, if you think about it, is kind of a big deal. Right, right, right. right. But I mean, yeah. like, that she actually is in personal possession at that moment of a lot of money. Yeah, she says it's in her purse. Okay, well then there you go. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Then I she I don't sold the house. Then. She sold you the house. You think he might have for... turned at that moment because well, he heard that? Like, well, what? I mean, what it depends on what no. universe of. Um, poverty we're trying to like uh portray here 
I mean, this guy's a government accountant, so. yeah. right? But there was, in in Italy at a certain time, we don't know how much right. that actually makes money wise. Like we yeah, don't. Right. I mean, this movie, in a certain way, as you talked about before, is about poverty. Yeah, and mm-hmm. um, where we have to wonder, like, is that what's the drive? I mean, like, why else would he push yeah. her off the the cliff? I think I think I think part of her him. attraction to him is the fact that he has a steady job. You know, it's 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 that she won't have to do this anymore because she'll right. she'll have she'll have someone to take care of her with a steady income. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously in her in her last long term relationship, uh, as as short as it was, it's, it's established as only being a month with Giorgio, but she was still she was still prostituting during that, or at least the suggestion is that she was. Yes. It's, it's never yes. suggested that she's been out of the game for a month. Um, so, you know, and Giorgio, I'm okay with not understanding his motivation because he's in the, only in the movie for two minutes and, and we start at the end of that relationship, so that's fine. But but this guy, uh, Oscar, um, you know, if he's on the level the entire time until he finds out that she's got 700,000 lira on her... Um, and then decides to kill her in that moment at the cafe. Uh, that's really that's not good storytelling. No, that's unlikely. No, well, okay, I agree so with then you on that. at the same time, are we then dealing with the fact that all the things he says are? Yeah, th- th- but if he's lies. been he's just if he's been lying the entire time and trying yeah. to manipulate her, I don't understand his motivation for thinking that's a worthwhile cause because right. his first interaction with her is. Now, the only thing he knows about her is what's revealed in that hypnotist scene, and in that hypnotist scene, uh, he's not. He, the hypnotist isn't digging for information. He's living out a fantasy with her about you know walking around a garden with right. this lover named Oscar, and he shows up and says, "Hey, isn't it funny? My name's Oscar. We should be lovers too, huh?" Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can think of is that <laughs> this guy, this accountant, is. Um... A crazy person. He's a psycho, and uh, uh, he. There's something more involved here that has to do with having power over her, right. yeah, uh, and and less to do with getting money or or anything like that. That's possible. And when he sees her fragility and he sees her naivete on the, in the the hypnotism scene, he realizes this is a good candidate for me to manipulate and use my power over to do something horrible. Yeah. That's the only thing I can think of. It's the only thing that really seems to make sense and. That is narratively the weakest uh, uh, move in this film. Is mm-hmm. why is this guy even involved with her? Um, and you know, uh, being a psycho is the only. Okay, reason Okay, so think. now we get into another thing because this is Fellini. Um, yeah. Is it necessary that he has a motivation for his action? Right. Because the I story is about it, her and yeah. the things that in sort of the tragedy of her optimism. Um, right. Is it necessary that this tool of that tragedy have a reason for why he does the things he does? Right. And, think, and the fact that it's unclear it is absolutely no problem to me yeah. uh, because of what you just said. Uh, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, in, in any other movie, I might be like, yeah, but there's this big right, problem. Like, and I don't who's like this it. crazy but in this character movie, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But in this movie... Yeah, exactly. But in this movie, you're absolutely right. It's not about the guy. It's not about Oscar the accountant. It's about yeah. Kiberia. So, well, yeah. yeah, I'm 100% with you. I think maybe I think maybe where, where I'm getting tripped up here is because I want there to be an antagonist, and there's not an antagonist in the movie. Right. He's the closest thing we have. But at the same time, he's not. He's not the antagonist. Right. So it's fine right. that he doesn't have any motivation because he's, right. he's something mean, for her to... He's, react to. He's a long form version of Giorgio. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's no real there's no real antagonist here. Obviously we have a, a very strong protagonist, but her goal is happiness and she's on the journey to, to get there. And we don't yeah. we're seeing a small part of that journey. A very I mean, small part of that journey. That's one thing that makes this film similar to uh, what we talked about uh, last time, Black Orpheus, <laughs> is that uh, it's not really so much about uh, you know, traditional narrative elements, and it's more about uh, a journey that a character wants to go down, and and the obstacles that that fall in that character's way. Yeah. And you know, in Black Orpheus, there was the the traditional like they they 
he gets there, but then he loses his way, and then the tragic downfall. Whereas in this movie, I think this is just a snippet kind of day in the life of a woman who's always going to be trying to look for optimism and happiness in her life. Absolutely. You know, like this, the story of what just happened to Kabiria, like she's not changed by the end of this. She's still going to, there's a chance she's going to have the same thing happen, you know, the next yeah. time. That's what I think is so genius about the opening of this film is that when she wakes up and she's all manic and throwing, throwing away Giorgio stuff and saying, like he cheated me and he's horrible and he burns uh, she burns her her pictures of him yeah. and she says this will never happen to me again right. and then the rest of the movie is about it happening to her again right and i don't so, i don't want her to change because the only way she could change would be to become more cynical right she yes. would be sacrifice worse, her optimism better. yeah yeah i agree well, with you, you yeah, i agree she smile you. she's on that final last scene we see that i don't think she has changed yeah she has yeah and and that's as she great. recovers from yeah, as she recovers from like almost being thrown off a cliff by this this guy, she walks out into the street and is surrounded by uh, what are probably more uh, poverty stricken people yeah. celebrating life and singing and dancing after this really tragic scene to go into this sort of buoyant singing and dancing thing, and she her frown tra- uh, turns into a smile and her optimism yeah. comes out. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's well, it's really nice. And I think we're, uh, she we can, certainly has not. It gives us the opportunity to believe that like her optimism will eventually result in this not happening. One time, yeah, this will not happen, yeah. and then we it'll be great. we still have that hope for yeah, it. Yeah, we don't. Right, right. Thank God he didn't kill her. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't say it enough. <laughs> <laughs> I I agree with you. I mean, you know, this is uh. uh, uh at at bottom, as much as this movie is about quote unquote uh, poverty and prostitution, and all this stuff, it's actually about uh, the the struggle that good people and optimistic people have in a world that isn't good and optimistic, and yeah. and about how she's trying to make her way as an optimist in this world, and uh, and maybe not rousingly successfully because she does go through some bad stuff but she is by the end happy to be alive, you know, and happy to be amongst those musicians on the street. So, yeah, that's, you know, for such a a downer of a movie during certain points of it, that's what what to me passes as a happy ending. So I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, I loved this movie, too. I know. Like, I I didn't love it (laughs) as much as I loved Black Orpheus last time. I didn't love the film, but like their elements of it, I think, are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say like I would say that there if I could take out some elements of it and make it my own <laughs> make a pat cut i could love it sure but because it's not the pat edition what what would you cut out of the pat i edition? don't know i i'd have to actually like go back and watch it and like make notes about what i would make cut notes. out there's sure. just it's certain parts of it just didn't um feel right i don't know i'm trying mm-hmm. to think hmm that's a good question and one I can't answer yeah. right now. It's unfortunate. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I there, there are. Um, this really is to me look it, like a series of vignettes, as you said, Adam. It's very uh, episodic. Yeah. Um, and and some vignettes work better than others. You know, I I don't super love the vignette with with her and the the movie star. Um, but I do really, really love the church vignette so much. Yeah. I mean, you can really see this actress's strength uh, as an actress in that scene when she's shouting out her prayers to to the Virgin Mary. It's just so gorgeous. She's so – she wants so bad for this stuff to actually make her life better. She wants so bad to turn her life around. Yeah. And you can see it in her face in those scenes. So that was uh, – you know, that was one of the vignettes I really loved. Yeah. And then I I really loved that, that directly after that, you know, as she realizes that despite all the talk amongst the entire group of them about what's changed, she realizes nothing's changed. Right. Uh, and for a moment she's disillusioned, and she yells at the nuns, uh, yeah. but then she stops and listens to them singing. Right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um... Speaking, speaking of cutting cutting things, uh, as far as pat cut of this movie goes, oh, right. uh, I, I did want to bring up that uh, in the Criterion Edition, there's a restored scene uh, referred to as the man with the sack. And this is between, um, between when she kind of gets distracted and starts following that little processional uh, on the street 
uh, and then the church scene proper. Um, she's wandering around sort of the wilderness and meets a guy who's who's going to all the homeless people who lives in caves and giving them uh, and giving them food and giving them uh, blankets and I. I guess, in a way, narratively for the movie, it might be important uh, that uh, you know she's meeting someone else good. <laughs> right? Is that, that what there it's is supposed good to more than that? Film? Is that like there's yeah. more to it than that? Because one of the people that they meet in the caves is a former prostitute. Oh yes, who used to be have her own house and be in the yes. same position no, as Kabiria. Right. And right. Kabiria sees this woman who's fallen from Kabiria's position into this low position of living in a cave and needing others to help her out. No, you're right. And this could be a breaking point for her. It could either be her descent into pessimism and like saying, "Oh my God, what is this life doing to me?" Or it could be a, a moment to to latch onto her optimism and say, "I can." make things better for myself no you're right so, you're right it is it is important well i wish that. i had seen yeah, that i didn't scene. even think about that yeah unfortunately pat uh pat seems to have watched the edition without that scene yes. um which is you know yeah. you're in japan sometimes things happen yeah. uh <laughs> i think it's interesting uh, collection here thank you very much i think it's interesting <laughs> by because of all the things all of the things in the movie that the church could have complained about and it was the Catholic Church that got this ban because they're very powerful. Eh, they got the scene cut. You know, they're powerful in Italy. Uh, they're powerful in a lot of places in the 50s. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, the complaint about that scene was that uh, the character of the man with the sack is not explicitly a priest. We- yeah. uh, and, and the church believed it was their job, their sole job, uh, to take care of the poor, charity was their sole job, and that they felt that it, to show someone who is not explicitly uh, at all affiliated with affiliated the church, affiliated with the church, That's really weird. Uh, performing charity was was an indirect attack on the church. I know uh, it's crazy. Yeah, that's the weirdest um, argument I've ever heard. Yeah, it's such a weird. So they they yeah, literally don't they, want people who are not the church being good. Well, it's it's yeah. more than that. It probably is in the context of the film where they show people who are affiliated with the church being kind of ineffectual. Yes. Uh, and not really right. accomplishing anything. But the one who actually is accomplishing something is this unaffiliated yeah. guy who just by his own volition and of his own heart, you know, goes out and tries to help people. Yeah. Uh, I, it could be, I, with that scene, it could be read as an indictment of the church's inability yeah. to well, actually I, take care of it. That is that is how they read it. Which so is, that is why it wasn't in the movie. Which is odd because which is maybe what it's meant to be. Well, I it mean, is. That's, yeah, I would I, not be surprised if Fellini was actually trying to attack the church and say the feeling the church gives you is good, but the church itself isn't doing yeah. enough. I wouldn't be surprised if they, he actually did. Well, intend. that wouldn't that surprise would, me yeah. at all. But considering like the larger context of the movie, it's such an almost minor element that it's like wow, really yeah. latched yeah. onto something there, didn't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a sort of weird, uh, in the, to establish the disconnection between that criticism and that censorship and, and the actual filmmakers uh, of, at the time, at least. And, and I'm sure the MPAA gets, gets into this too now. Um, Fellini's, Fellini's uh, sort of response to that was, uh, quote, I could have responded that the man with the sack was a Catholic, a very good example of a Catholic who was taking individual responsibility. But I didn't know whom I should tell that to. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I talk to about not getting censored? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so he didn't necessarily... I, I could see it as, as an indictment of the church for being ineffectual, but it was also you know, a celebration right. of the individual. Right, an um, individual initiative to do good, which sure. is an yeah. important thing for her to see yes. as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this movie is not actually that dark, uh, you know? There's, like, there's some, some the, the women are engaged in kind of a quote-unquote dark career as prostitutes, well, but, like, yeah. none of them are ever beaten by their Johns, you know? Yeah. Nobody, like, they talk about coke, but nobody ever, like, overdoses or anything. It seems like everybody's got pretty good lives, you know? It's never that dark. It's always pretty light. Yeah. Which is what all so. contributes to the reason why I had no idea that they were prostitutes. <laughs> no, like everything <laughs> wasn't you dark enough about for her you. Hunt, you know, when you watch it, her hunt for love and all this stuff, it's really like, even now, hard for me to read them as prostitutes. Like yeah. in the, in the like, 
I've I've made a career decision, and my career decision is prostitute sort of way. It's more like they do these things that they feel they have to yeah. do to get a little bit of extra money to be able to buy food. Drugs. Or drugs or whatever. Or food. Or cars. They do talk about drugs. Yeah, they do talk about drugs, but yeah. you yeah. don't see them ever doing it. Like, lots of people talk exactly. about drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think your reading of the movie is closer to the reality of the movie, which is that these are not, like, career call girls. Like, right, exactly. Uh, of all of the people in the film who 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 engage in any prostitution, quote-unquote, um, the only one that looks like she's probably an actual career prostitute is the one who's always shouting. Yeah, right, yeah. The young, yeah, the I read street. her as a prostitute immediately. Yeah, and First she's the only one that you can really have that reading of. I agree with you. And I yeah. think we're supposed to so, draw a comparison between her and them. Yes. Like, well, that it is a possible fate, but also not what they are yes. now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like, they could turn into this jaded, kind of gross version of prostitution uh, if they're not careful. Yeah. Because yeah, they're still young. They're still all so young, you know? Yeah, they could turn into that, or they could turn into the, the woman living woman in the in cave. cave. Yeah. Um, and you know, among that's, other options, that's part, yeah, I mean, among other options, it's not know, cave or prostitute. So, it's cave, prostitute, yeah, yeah. or other <laughs> right. things. You know, right. and well, there's also something sort of uh, anti-feminist about the idea that Kibiri is always looking for a man to take her out of this game. Yeah, um, you know, but the, I, it was the I, I'll chalk that up to the, the guy who wrote Solo. Mm, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I would chalk it up to the mid late fifties uh, in yeah. <laughs> cinema, uh, but but yeah, you know, and that's that's fine, you know, considering the period that it's in. I don't know if we could expect much better, um, but and that's a weird thing for what it was. Is that if it were made a little God. bit later, that last scene could have been totally different and changed the entire movie. If this had made yeah. been made ten years later, this movie could have been about her realizing that that's not what she needs right liberating herself right, exactly from the men in the yeah. world and all yeah. they'd have to do is change like the last like three minutes from yeah. what it is now which is but gorgeous it, to yeah. another different but, kind it, of but it would also sort of it would also uh, sort of betray the film's desire to to uh to show kabiri as somebody that doesn't really have to change she yeah, already has true. all the ingredients for good in her you know so but but you are right that like if this if that film I just on Dan Harmon's podcast recently, he was talking about like the Jawsification of cinema, how the movie Jaws and like that era of cinema made people like really pay attention to beginning, middle, and end. Characters change, things happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas before that, art film was very much like characters don't have to change. You don't have to have this like development from A, B, C, D. You can just show something and let audiences see something like this is what's in front of you uh, this is a person look at how this person behaves and i think this movie is a great example of like that classic uh art art cinema you know this is just a person living in the world and this is how this person acts now go sit in her shoes for you know two hours or whatever it was yeah i think that's a really valuable point and i hadn't thought about that but actually that brings up one of the reasons why i found this film a little hard to watch is I mm-hmm. do expect that progression. Development. Yeah. And, when, and, and yeah. when a movie yeah. doesn't give me that, that last half an hour is always really right. tough. It's a slog. Yeah, like, yeah, and I felt that way during this movie a little bit. was like I found myself fading in interest. And then like luckily the last scene, like the last whatever five, ten minutes is really – brought me in in fact i had to rewind it and rewatch it because i was like oh i wasn't paying attention and something really interesting just happened um yeah. but like it's um yeah i it does pose a problem though because when you have been the audience as well has been jawsified and yes, i absolutely. expect my characters to grow and change Right, that makes and sense. And progress in a journey. Yeah. And if they don't do that, it gets harder to watch. I get that. Not impossible, uh, but harder. Mm. I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's a good well, film. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it is. And, yeah. and, 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 <laughs> I think we're all we're all we're all well, trying to think of something else to ask, say, like, but what, what, that's really what would be the pat cut. The pat cut would just yeah. be slightly shorter so that I don't get tired in the last <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> all right. well, in all that honesty, it will, it's part of the same problem with Armacord is that the vignette style means that like I get a certain number of vignettes in and I'm like, oh man. It doesn't necessarily keep you involved. Right, exactly. And yeah, well, you also, understand that. you know, after this quote-unquote Jawsification effect, you can sort of see, like, oh, we're in the part of the film where this is Right, happening. exactly. Or, oh, oh, you yeah, know. Rising action, you know, falling action, and all that That means jazz. we're getting near the end or yeah. whatever it is. Uh, so you don't have any of those clues in this movie. I mean, this could go on forever. And that's, to me, part of its charm, but certainly part of its... Uh, um, uh, difficulty right. to digest I, for a modern audience. Yeah, it's not fair to so. call it bad or anything like that. I think it's just that it is difficult. I found it difficult. Yeah. And like yeah, I, I entertainment get that. to me doesn't necessarily need to be difficult. <laughs> it's it reminds me of my movie, my film classes and stuff where somebody tells me I have to watch this thing because it's amazing. A challenge. Yeah, and yeah. Then, like you just have to get through it. And it's like yeah, mm-hmm. that's probably true because at the end, having seen it will affect the way I think about things. I will be different right. for having seen it, but that however much time I'm going to dedicate to seeing it is very difficult. Yeah. I'm with you that I'm skeptical of anybody that says something is good because it's well, challenging. Well, it's like reading Catcher you know, in the Rye or something like that, where it's like it's it's in the end theoretically rewarding, but the actual process is painful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that there is at least an uh, at least an impulse amongst certain people to say, y- you know, something is good for you because it's difficult, right? right. There's, there was a Slate article not that long ago that was about like eating your cultural vegetables, uh, sitting through the things that are culturally kind of difficult because they're important, and I am skeptical of like that very very seriously. Um, you know, I think the best art is stuff that doesn't feel difficult at all. Uh, but but I, I I do I do I agree with you that there are things where there is an end that is uh, rewarding and you do have to challenge yourself to get to the rewarding end. But I would never start from the supposition that because it's difficult, right, that it's uh, it, automatically it therefore rewarding. must be rewarding. Yeah. yeah, and I think there are people that do start from that supposition. Um, that said, I, I I know you you found this one difficult. I I did not, uh, and I thought it was charming and, and lovely. But I totally understand. It. Totally well, understand what you found sort of uh, 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 annoying about it for sure. Well, and we've had this problem before where me and Adam have had this conversation where, like, if the situation where I watched the film were different, it would have mm-hmm. been a totally different film for me. I mean, you know, it, no it. matter how you do, you cut the how you cut it, like your situation in life affects and like affects how you see how you read it and see it and. And today I was, you know, just not in a, like, watching this film mood. <laughs> and so, like, Got it. if it had been a different day, it probably, I probably would have been able been to different. sit through the entire thing going, oh, this is really interesting. So. Yeah. 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 I, get I would saying. never tell yeah. somebody not to watch this. That's for sure. I would say, you know, you should sure, see sure. it. But, yeah. This isn't right. solo. This is, no, this, this is not Armageddon anything I would ever tell somebody this, this is Sal. bad. I would say, like, you know. <laughs> Make yeah. sure you are in the right frame of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. So. Yeah, but right. yeah, that's about all, all right. I think. Well, well we're thank terrible you ending again this for joining podcast, us, Adam. No, not, I was, I was, I was doing well, and then you well, interrupted. Yeah, well, and that felt like one of our good ones. No, 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 <laughs> the ending, the ending specifically. The, I, oh, I started okay. to say that right as you were about to actually end the podcast, and now I feel bad. <laughs> but there was about it's a okay, five though. second pause of like. Hmm. I forgive you, Pat. <laughs> I forgive you. I'm sorry. Anyway. Thank you once again, Stephen, for joining us uh, for Knights of Kiberia, uh, Fellini 1957. Next week, uh, we uh, will be talking about another <laughs> Fellini film. We don't know what it is. Uh, it's And the Ship Sails On uh, from 1984, I believe. Uh, it's one of his last movies. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, big, obviously a big difference. Uh, from 1957 to 1984, yeah. so it'll be interesting to yeah, see, I'm actually uh, curious about see how uh, 
Yeah. Um, so that's post on record though. Right, so right. I, but I, like, I don't know how that's going to do for well, you. Well, but if but. he gets even weirder, it could be fun. It might yes. loop back around. Yeah, right. Maybe. It's totally possible to get weird enough that I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's hope so. Uh, thank you once again for listening. This is Lost in Criterion. Uh, I am the Adam Glass with me always, uh, John Patrick Owatari Dory. Hey, you got my name right. Us, I got your name right. Joining this week with Stephen Goldmeyer, uh, yeah. who uh, who blogs at uh, what's the name of your blog? I'm sorry. Uh, Enchantment <coughs> Under the Sea. Enchantment Under the Sea dot org. Yes, is the website. Yes, um, and former IO9 contributor. Yes, and former IO9 Just contributor. FYI. He used to be in the masthead, uh, but now there's no masthead. So right. Things have changed over there. Things so have so changed. Right. Anyway. Into that website. Thank you again. We'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Goodbye. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Oatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.